Good afternoon. Am uh, I live? I think so. Yes, yes, we are live, Adrian. Uh, so welcome everybody. Welcome to statistics session. And today I will be your chair. And this is this will be great pleasure for me. We have great speakers in this session. And I'm also quite excited to listen down with you. And sorry for being a bit late and it caused because of some delays on the previous slide. Also, we had very small technical issue, but I hope this, this will not happen again. All right, so I don't want to take your time more because we already have delays and I would like to pass the stage to Adrian. Adrian, um, I wish you good luck with your internet connection. And <laughs> so you have 15 minutes, so good luck. Thank you very much. Um, uh, hello, good afternoon. Um, my name is Adrian Fulton. Um, I'm working for Alcado Technology. Um, and I will be talking today about uh, using priors of proportion or rate based features to increase their predictive power. Now, um, uh, I will start with. Uh, telling you just one or two words about myself and Okado so that you know where I come from. And then, you know, I'll spend like 95% of the rest <laughs> on, uh, on the actual content. So uh, I'm coming from different fields and those who know me know that I do not only do data science in life. I also have a lot to do with psychoacoustics and music. But recently, uh, meaning recent 10 years or more in my life, <laughs> I became uh, interested in data science and its applications in business. I went through a number of um, uh, large uh, organizations, including McKinsey, Avon, and, and HelloFresh. Now I'm at Ocado Technology. Now, what is actually Ocado? So Ocado, first of all, is a UK online retailer that has now uh, has uh, launched a um, uh, what is called Okado Smart Platform, which is the, uh, a effectively a software as a service, uh, um, providing uh, retailers with everything they need effectively to go online. Uh, meaning, it's a process from e-commerce through. Um, um, delivery uh, fulfillment to delivery. So effectively, you know, it's a it's a, a comprehensive solution, and part of that solution uh, are of course uh, intelligent solutions. We have, uh, for instance, automated warehouses. There are very nice um, videos online. I'm not going to show you because this is a <laughs> really a flash talk. <laughs> But I want, just want to tell you that, you know, we have a global presence now with uh, lots of clients in on three continents or four, if you count exactly. Um, and uh, I think it's still expanding. So as part of our uh, platform, we, of course, want to uh, you look at um, machine learning as, um, as a tool to um, um, increase satisfaction of our clients and you know just boost customer experience which is about personalization it's about streamlining the whole uh, the whole purchasing process and automation uh, so within that uh, realm uh, I'm going to talk about rate-based features and uh, specifically about a customer decision on substitutions uh, that's uh, for anyone who worked in retail, uh, you probably know that this is a really tough thing to, to get right. <laughs> um, how to send the right substitution for a product which is out of stock. And technically what happens is that a customer can uh, at doorstep when he or she receives that uh, carton box <laughs> or a set of bags can also say, okay, well, I don't like this substitute, I'm gonna reject it. And typically what happens is that sadly it drives uh, to a large extent uh, the waste cost and impacts the PNL. So getting your substitutions right is actually uh, one of the key challenges that you might have when you think about um, um, AI 
applications in retail. So um, if looking at this from, uh, from various angles, um, what are the challenges really behind this? So first of all, uh, when we talk about rate features, so rate-based features, they represent proportions. So it can be anything, it could be the rejection rate of a substitute. Uh, it could be also conversion rate. It could be a percent of the deliveries. It could be pretty much anything that you find uh, where you find a feature, which uh, obviously has some base and, and some uh, share of successes or events that happen. And um, the problem with this kind of predictors is that, of course, you uh, run into small sample sizes. So um, typical uh, stra tackling strategies for this are, for instance, that you can just discard those observations with, with small sample size. Well, but you can also treat them as missing. So for instance, you can effectively uh, use some kind of prior value meaning that this is a mean or a median of a given uh, of a given uh, feature well you can also add some dummy variables and leave as is <laughs> you can use categorical variables only if you think that for instance uh, behind those uh, those historical rejection rates there is no more uh, information than just the category the sub in the parent category or the grandparent category or the brand of a given item. And so, you know, we just need the categorical information there. Well, as it happens, um, uh, we've been investigating this, uh, this problem for a while. And uh, for, a, for specifically for uh, substitution rejection rates, we are looking at different levels of those rejections. So you can have a rejection rate of, uh, on the level of an item, but you can also have it on the level of a brand, uh, which typically spans broader than a category. Then you can have a category, parent category, grandparent category. Uh, this category trees actually go much higher than this, but technically it's mm, normally fine or sufficient to, to use only three or four levels. And um, the thing here is that uh, by using typical categorical variables, which denote parent, grandparent, category, or brand, you need to revert typically to some kind of coding. It can be a kind of coding where you where you just um, replace it with counts, you can replace it with um, with the um, value of the dependent variable, which tends to overfit, by the way. And you know there are there are different strategies how to handle this, but technically, uh, what you could also do is just have a look at what is the actual rejection rate on the level of a category, on the level of parent category, on the level of grandparent category, and the level of brand, for instance. And then the problem starts where when the sample behind this is very low. And uh, this, this feature uh, starts to you know, uh, uh, show outliers. So how do we deal with this problem? Um, one of the ways to deal with this is to, uh, to use a prior, to use a uh, specifically uh, for a binomially distributed uh, phenomenon like rejecting a, a substitute. Uh, the conjugate prior is, is the beta prior. So beta, beta is a distribution that behaves very nicely and it's also um, is a conjugate prior for the binomial distribution, which means that you can easily compute the posterior distribution based on it. So if, if you have a small sample of a given rate, then what you can do is just compute what is the most likely value of, the, uh, of this rate based on updating uh, the 
prior value with your small sample of, uh, of observations. And how do you do that? Well, first of all, uh, you need to somehow come up with the uh, parameters of the prior distribution. There are various methods to do that. The, the simplest I, I can recommend is just the method of moments where you just compute the, um, the parameters from uh, you know, the historical uh, values of mean rejection rate and variance of the rejection rate. Uh, typically, if you uh, if you compute the uh, uh, the uh, prior, for instance, for a category, then you would take you would take those historical values from one level higher, which means, for instance, from the parent category. Yeah, and then uh, computing the posterior distribution is really very simple, meaning that you you just uh, add the the rejection rate to the uh, to the prior uh, parameter. Um, so uh, the, the question is now, is that really an effective strategy in any way? Um, so what I did, I actually set up an, ex an offline experiment. I took a, a data of a European retailer, which we have access to. I um, set it up in a way where I have a rejection uh, uh, rate in the 40 days uh, following the training period as my dependent variable. And then my features were rejection rates on the level of category, parent, grandparent category and brand separately for uh, the item and separately for the potential substitute. I chose the simplest method possible, which is just random forest. It can be done with, of course, with more sophisticated methods, but I wanted also it to, uh, to scale well so that I can you know, do more experiments rather than wait <laughs> for, for instance, uh, uh, for, uh, for XGBoost. So um, I uh, took five cases, which is, uh, the one which are effectively the ones which I uh, told you about first uh, in initially. So first is just leaving as is, then filling in the, those cases with low counts with median, so treating them effectively as missings, then discarding the observations at all, using categorical var variables. So for instance, instead of the rejection rate of a category, I would use the category name itself and actually code it as, for instance, a count. Yeah. And then the final thing is using a beta prior, meaning that I, I update both the training set and the validation set. I don't update the test set, by the way. I only update this, uh, the beta priors in the training and the, the validation set. And I will measure two uh, KPIs now, it, it might be uh, surprising for you to see recall here because it's a it's a um, uh, it's a regression model effectively, <laughs> uh, but uh, it's it's a model where I'm interested in the ranking. So effectively, I what I want to see is based on the predictions, can I make the best possible ranking of sub of potential substitutes for a given for a given item, meaning that if I rank the um, uh, the uh, my my substitutes by this prediction, the top one hopefully will be also the top one as in the test data. Yeah, and of course, you know, as in any regression model, you can also use the typical measures like root mean squared error. I'm also looking at this. But my preference is for higher recall and reasonable root mean square error and not the other way around. Because my, uh, the idea behind this model is to get the best substitute uh, so that we can send the best substitute to, to a customer. So the one which has the lowest probability of being rejected. Um, and here are results of this. Um, and to be honest, I, when, 
I was surprised to see this. Uh, I thought that the classical methods would really uh, give you, uh, you know, on par results. And it does seem that using beta priors helps, especially it does help in case of recall. Um, in case of root mean square error, it's okay. It's not the best one, but it's, well, it seems to be the second best here, but it, it doesn't matter. It's okay. Uh, the, the, the really important thing is that, you know, it, it gives me like 2.5 percentage points of recall more. And that really is a lot if you think about how much money you can make on those or not lose technically on those um, uh, those substitutes which uh, which are not rejected. Last so, one minute, Adrian. Yes, that's, I'm I'm last on my last slide. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. uh, so to conclude, uh, as you can see, rate based features could be correct for uh, for their priors, and it does display a higher predictive power. Of course, it. It is especially true in, in case of using regression results for ranking. Now, if you, if you saw, uh, um, as you saw you know, uh, in, in the previous slide, the root mean squared error was actually not the best one, but the ranking that did actually the trick. Yeah? And uh, of course, there is more to be done on the choice of strength of, of prior, for instance. Uh, I was using the method of moments, so just the simplest method to come up with, you know, the the, um, uh, the prior distribution. There could be different ways of how to handle this. Uh, also, using, for instance, the historical medians uh, of uh, number of substitutes. Uh, and I was also investigating this. It didn't give me better results, but you know, it it is still remains to be seen. And of course, you know the cross validation and uh, and, and more sophisticated uh, prediction method could be used here that's uh, that's a separate uh, story but um, uh, the actual final test will always be the the online test and this is what we are now in the process of doing so there is an ongoing a b test well actually launching very soon and we will be able to see the results of it we from the very very initial results see that it does work indeed that's it. Thank you very much. If you like uh, Okado technology, please come to us. <laughs> Thank you very much and use this. Well, actually, not the Zoom chat. I should say the the uh, Slack chat, Slack. right? Yes, Slack exactly. Chat. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. No problem. That's it. Perfect, Adrian. Thank you so much. It was quite interesting and it was a pleasure to listen to you. All right. So let's go on. Um, our next speaker will be Mihao Mai, and I would like to invite Mihao Mai to this stage. And he's going to talk about his R package. He recently developed it. So yes. Over to you, Mihao. Thanks, Abu. Can right. you see my screen? Definitely, we can see your screen. And also, just a quick reminder, you can uh, ask your questions to the speakers on Slack channel. Of course, you can also ask on the YouTube chat. And we already dropped link to our Slack channel. You are more than welcome. Okay, Mihal, it's yeah. over to you. Good luck. Thanks, Algum. Okay, so so like Algum said, I will talk today about my R package for object detection and image segmentation. But uh, very quickly about me. So first of all, you can contact me anytime on LinkedIn and on Twitter, and of course on Wire Slack. Basically, if you have any questions about the package or maybe more generally about deep learning or computer vision in R and not only in R. So for the last five years, I was working mostly as a data scientist and currently I want to become a computer vision expert. Yeah, so Platavus is actually my first big deep learning package and my first big open source package, to be honest. And in Platavus, you can do two things. First of all, you can uh, do semantic segmentation using the unit model. And second of all, you can perform a object detection task using YOLO3. If you want uh, more details, examples, you can visit the GitHub page. And currently, the package isn't on Chrome because it's only the first beta version. But hopefully, in a 
few months it will it will be available also on Chrome. Yeah. So very quickly, what is actually um, what are different computer vision tasks? So you probably know what is image classification. If you are using Keras, you know that you have to build, for example, conventional neural network. Uh, your images will be the input, and as the output, you will get probability of probability or multiple probabilities for a different class to this image. So, for example, we are asking, uh, is it a cat on this image? Semantic segmentation is actually really similar, but this time we are asking uh, not only for one probability, but for the probability or probabilities for each pixel of an image. So, we would like to find different pixels that are in a cat class, in a grass class, tree, sky, etc., etc. But note that in semantic segmentation, we are actually not saying anything about the localization of the cat. So nothing about the localization of the object more generally. If you want to know anything about the localization of the object, we would have to perform object detection task. Uh, this one in the middle, which is called localization, is actually a special case of object detection when we've got only, only one object. So in object detection task, we are, of course, classifying the objects that are in the image, but also we are creating this bounding boxes around them. So we want to find localization. Besides semantic segmentation and object detection, there's, only, there's also a task called instance segmentation, which is basically, basically a mix of semantic segmentation and object detection. And it's currently not available in Platypus. But in semantic segmentation, we are classifying the different pixels to the classes but also we would like to know um, where we can find different instances. So for example, we want to know that the dog in a red is something else than the dog in a green. Yeah, so let's start with image segmentation with unit. What you can see is the unit architecture and its name came from, from the letter U because it, the, the shape of the architecture actually resembles it. So it's, it's really simple architecture and, and you can think of it as an autoencoder. So we've got some images in grayscale or in RGB as an input and as an output, we are getting basically a classification mask. So we will get another tensor where height and width of, of this tensor is the same as the original image inputted. And we will get as many channels as many classes we have. So each pixel will, will get n probabilities. Yeah, so the most, the most important thing to remember is that in the beginning we are downscaling an image using convolutional blocks, then we've got the bridge, and later on we are upscaling the image using, using uh, the convolutional blocks. So let's go to the example. Yeah, it will be a nuclei detection, so it is binary semantic segmentation. We would like to know uh, which pixels uh, are from the nuclei and which pixels are from the background. It will be a really simple task. So in the Platypus, you can create a unit architecture using unit function. What you have to specify is first of all, net height and width, so input image height and width. And the restriction here is that it has to be in the form the two, two to the power of n. Yeah, another thing we have to we have to specify is of course number of classes and like I said here we've got back, background and nuclei and number of convolutional and the convolutional blocks. So here it will be four. We've got also another arguments, but those are arguments known from uh, convolutional neural network from Keras. So filters, dropout, batch normalization, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. After our architecture is created, we have to, like in Keras, compile the model. Uh, and of course, we will use simple compile function. As a loss, you can use, for example, categorical cross entropy if you want. Anything for the for anything that would work for the image classification task would work in, in semantic segmentation task. But if you want, you can also you have implemented uh, loss dice and as a metric dice coefficient which is basically an F1 score for semantic segmentation task. So you've got a choice here. Yeah. After that, the most important, most important part is data ingestion. So in Platypus, you've got a segmentation generator and the most important arguments are basically the path where we can find the images and the masks, the mode, 
And let me show you the data set maybe. So if we will go to our training path, which will be stage one train, as you can see, each image has, it all, has its own folder. And if we will go inside, we'll see two sub subdirectories, images and masks. So first of all, in segmentation generator, you've got also this, argu this argument called subdirs, when you, where you can specify basically the names of the site subdirectories. In images, we've got our original image. And in mask, we've got one or multiple masks. So in Platypus, basically, uh, you don't have to think about about merging the masks, it will it will do it automatically for you. Right. Another arguments are net height and width, and of course another arguments known from Keras. So the last important argument is color map. So basically, color map specifies tells Platypus how to recognize uh, which pixel uh, is. In a, in a specified class. So for example, here we've got only two different classes, background and uh, nuclei, and the binary color map will have only two elements. So first element is telling us that uh, we've got some coding in RGB, which is 000, which is black. So black pixels are in a, in a background and white pixels are in a nuclei class. Yeah, so after creating a generator, we can, of course, fit the model, and we will use fit generator function, also known from Keras. So actually, there's nothing new. There's no new syntax here. And similarly, if you want to predict or on a new samples, we will create a new generator for test data set and use predict generator function from Keras. The only new thing here is that now, uh, as the prediction, we've got the output and some number of n probabilities for each pixels, and we would like to turn it into a valid mask. So to do this, we simply have to take our probabilities, our color map, and use get mask function. And as the output, you will get something like that. You can in Platypus, you can also plot masks uh, with images. So on the left, we we've got our original images. On the right, we've got our predicted masks. And to be honest, that's it. Syntax is really, really simple. Yeah, in case of object detection, uh, you can use the yellow free model. It's a little bit more complicated, but what's important is that as the input, we've got image in RGB, RGB or grayscale, and as the output, we've got three different tensors. So in each tensor, uh, each tensor is actually representing a grid, and each cell on a grid is basically predicting some number of boxes. Uh, yeah, so in this prediction, we for, for, for one box, we've got probability that there is an object, class probabilities, and box coordinates. We have to actually, we don't have uh, strict box coordinates like height and width and center of the image, but we are actually asking how our predictions are different from something called anchor box. But uh, I don't want to talk about it today. Yeah, so in the end, we will have a lot of different boxes. So for example, three boxes for, for each cell, and we've got, of course, three different grids. So we have to remove all the boxes with low probability that uh, the object was found. And in the end, we will end up with something like this. So we will have only boxes with, with high probability. Yeah, so I will show you another example. It will be blood cell detection. Uh, again, we have to start with, with some arguments. As it was in UNET, we have to specify net height and net width. Here, uh, the restriction is it has to be divisible by 32. We have to specify number of anchors. So like I said, each grid is predicting some number of, of binding boxes. And you can think basically of this argument anchors per grid as the number of predicted bounding boxes in a, in, a, in a grid, in a cell. And of course, we have to create anchors for our custom data set. So you can use generate anchors function. And as the output, you will get this plot. So plotted are our original bounding boxes. So 
each bounding box has some height and width. And it was, of course, normalized here by the image height and width. And we are basically using uh, Kanye's neighbors algorithm to, to get some centroids as our anchors. Yeah, so we've got anchors, we've got other arguments, so we can now create our architecture. And you can use YOLO3 function for that. So you have to specify, of course, input, in, input image height and width. Will it be grayscale, number of classes, and of course, anchors. And if you want to use fine tuning, you can also load weights uh, trained on the Coco dataset, which has 80 different classes from software called, called Darknet, because YOLO models were, were originally created in Darknet. Yeah. Later on, you have to also compile the model like it was in, in Keras. So here you don't have really a choice. You have to use YOLO free loss and your of YOLO free metric. Loss looks a little bit complicated, but it's actually sum of uh, mean square error losses and objectives losses. And as a metric, we've got intersection over union. Yeah. Next part is creating a generator. And here we can read annotation in XML and the JSON. And later on, similarly, we have to uh, feed the model using feed generator function, get our predictions using predict generator function, and in the end, transform our row predictions and clean, clean the boxes using get the boxes functions. Yeah, it will, it will basically look something like that. Yeah. Last one minute, Michal. Sure, I'm finishing. Okay. Yeah. So, so what, you, yeah, what you see, what you can see here are valid valid uh, bounding boxes in, in a clear form for, for some sample image. And of course, you can plot them and save them to, to, to your computer using plot boxes functions. And it will, it will look something like that. Yeah, so further development. So I'm really interested in applications of computer vision, computer vision uh, for medicine. So to be honest, I would like to add ability to read medical images, images in a, for example, DICOM format and automatic preprocessing, for example, clash algorithms for those images. But also, as you probably see in, in, the, our, in my custom generators, there was no data augmentation method. So at the, in, the, in the first stage, I have to pay some technological debt at data augmentation methods, test examples, etc. And of course, in the end, when everything will be finished, I would like to add more deep learning models, like faster RCNN, SSD, Unit++, and many, many more, probably. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you so much, Michal. So we don't have time for the questions, but as uh, I think our um, listeners already know that they can ask questions on Slack. All right. So it was extremely great, and I'm, I'm really uh, keen to use your package soon. Perfect. All right. So let's jump to our next speaker and who is going to be Christian Zielinski. And he's going to talk about outlier detection using self-organizing math. Christian, stage is yours. Good luck. Thank you so much. Okay, so I will share the screen with you. And uh, can you see my presentation? Yes, perfectly. Okay, so cool. Sorry. Thank you very much. So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Christian Zieniski and today I would like to talk with you a little bit about the usage of self-organized map in area of outlier detection. Uh, this topic was actually a part of my master's thesis supervised by Krzysztof Neiman, a professor from University of Gdańsk. So special shout out for him and let's jump straight into the topic. So what are the outliers in uh, statistics? Uh, well, the definition says uh, in many different books that those are the points that uh, differ significantly from the other observations, let's say typical observations. Uh, and the defi definition itself makes the issue a problem because what does it mean it differs significantly? Well, it depends uh, on the problem and on the data set that we are facing. So that's why uh, we still are uh, investigating the, the topic, even though it was noticed a long time ago that it, it is an issue. So, okay, it is an issue, but why should we even care about it? Well, there are two main reasons for that. Uh, the first one is that 
for some of the RPS, uh, the detection of outliers can be uh, a solution of a problem itself. So for example, in financial institutions, uh, the fraud detection is very similar to outlier detection because the unusual behaviors of the customers may indicate that those, there were some fr frauds. Uh, the same goes for the medical care or uh, cybersecurity. And the second uh, uh, reason would be that including the outliers in the data set uh, may bias our uh, models, may bias our thinking about the data. So we should think really carefully about this topic before we even go into the analysis of a data set. Okay, so this is well-known topic. Uh, so why are we talking about it once again and trying to use self-organized map for this? We have already a couple of different methods used especially for that. So isolation forests, uh, local player factors and so on. And they, they, they are great for that. Well, that's true, but every different method has its flaws. So for example, we found that uh, for isolation for forest, if we have uh, different groups in our data set and the quantity of observations for each group is, is, is different, then for the whole group with the smallest quantity of the observation, there will be higher uh, isolation scores assigned. So the whole group will be treated as an outliers. Uh, it's understandable globally, we could say that those are outliers, but uh, for, for some of the data sets, those smaller groups may have like a couple of thousands of observations. And then maybe it is some a niche that we should uh, think deeper than just as an outliers. And when it comes to the local outlier factors, well, the theory is great for that, but uh, usually for the real uh, life problems, uh, it has a tendency to have lower scores, uh, lower uh, results than the other methods used. So what is SOM and how it works? Uh, the self-organized map is a type of uh, unsupervised neural network proposed by Theo Kohonen uh, in 1980s. Uh, and uh, basically the, the whole point is to map our observations to a set of neurons. Uh, those neurons uh, create a map with, uh, for, uh, with a given size. Uh, and then we are analyzing those zeros in terms of, for example, classification, grouping, and so on. And in this example, our, our, in outlier detection area. So uh, how the SOM actually is uh, trained? Uh, basically, for each of the observations, we are looking for the closest neuron, so which is called best matching unit. Uh, we are calculating the distance between all of the neurons. The, the closest one is, is best matching unit, and we are shifting the vector of wages of this neuron towards the, these observations. But not only that, uh, not only the best matching unit is shifted, but also their neighbors are also shifted towards the observation. Uh, and it iterates uh, throughout all of the observations a couple of times, and then we are ended up with a trained map that uh, shows our data set uh, with uh, neurons. So here we can see the, um, the presentation of those neurons as uh, wages of those neurons. But what makes this method special is the, um, that it works for multidimensional data sets and it allows us to, um, to show the, the structure, the topology of those data sets uh, in two dimensions. So in this example, we can see the real, uh, relative uh, positions of those neurons on our two-dimensional map. Uh, and therefore we can see what's the actual structure of this uh, data set. And we can map uh, some of the um, features of those neurons uh, with a color to our map. So in this example, the number of units uh, that we can say are assigned to the neurons. So the, the neuron is the best matching unit for, for those observations. Okay, so how can we use it for outlier detection uh, purpose? The, there are two different approaches. First, uh, first one is based on distance from best matching units. So each observation has its uh, best matching unit. And usually uh, it goes like that, that a lot of the observations are very close to the best matching unit and some of them are uh, further away from it. 
And based on that, we can say that, okay, if the unit is further away the, from the best matching unit, it means that something is wrong with this observation. Probably it indicates that it might be an outlier. So the further the observation is from base matching unit, the, the, the higher the chance that uh, it is an outlier. So now, how to find the cutoff? Uh, well, we studied this topic uh, and it seems like uh, because of the nature of this uh, algorithm, the distances from best matching unit are, are always right skewed. And uh, the distribution uh, seems to be like closely approximated by, uh, by such distributions. So we used uh, the method from the adjusted box plots uh, adjusted for skewed data with uh, mid-couple distance. Uh, of course, we don't have the, mm, the threshold for the uh, left boundary because the closer it is, the better, the more typical the observation is. So this would be the, mm, the first thing. So detecting the outliers based on the distance from best matching unit. The second approach is detecting the outlying neurons themselves. So it might happen that the observation is very close to the best matching unit, but the neuron is so far away from the other neurons, or it has only small amount of the observations assigned that it indicates that this neuron is uh, mapped to some kind of outliers uh, in the whole data set. In this example, we have neurons 6, 13th, and 25th, which are uh, the, the further away from the from the neighbors and also they have the smallest amount of the observations assigned to them uh, not counting the empty neurons of course and it might indicate that those neurons have uh, outliers themselves and what makes this uh, method uh, unique is that uh, it is suitable for both local and global outliers because we can use the two different approaches there. And also it is capable of handling the groups in our data set. So first we will find the group in our data set and then treat the, those groups separately in terms of outlier detection. So it somehow solves the issue with the uh, smallest group that isolation forest uh, actually faced. Uh, the whole approach is very straightforward. It is only four steps. So first of all, we have to train the self-organized map uh, and then mark the observations assigned to outlying neurons as anomalies. Uh, well, which neurons are outlying? It's up to discussion. Uh, we didn't automate this, this part yet. Uh, so it uh, needs a uh, person to decide what are the outlying neurons. Step three is find groups in their test set, if there are any. Uh, and the, the last step is mark the observations, which are the further away from the best matching unit as outliers. So that's it. Couple of lines of code in R. Uh, and voila, we have it. This is the, the whole approach for it. Uh, we tried this uh, method for a couple of widely used uh, data sets, widely used in this area at least. So SMTP, satellite, and shuttle. And uh, it actually works. It's uh, very close to the isolation forest and uh, local outlier fact uh, factor. So time, it is even better for those data sets. Especially in SMTP, we can see that uh, the treating the observations uh, as a groups uh, made the methods way, way better than the, than the other ones. Uh, for satellite and shuttle, we identified that some of the neurons were extremely different from their neighbors. So the distance from neighbors was very huge and the profile of neuron was completely different than from the others. And those neurons actually had uh, global anomalies uh, assigned to them. Okay, but uh, we have the method, it seems great, but uh, as every method, it has some flaws. So the computing time. Unfortunately, training some is tough. Uh, it takes more time than isolation forest. Also training the proper self-organizing map uh, takes a bit of time because 
the we have to decide what will be the shape of the uh, of the sum, uh, what will be the learning rate, and so there are a lot of uh, hyperparameters there, and we have to be careful when we are training uh, tuning them. Uh, large dimension, yeah, uh, training some on data sets with more than let's say 10 dimensions uh, may be very tricky uh, because it's well we have to mm, visualize it in two dimensions so it will be tough the the method might not be very uh, easy to use to extract the proper groups within those data sets and then there are a bunch of problems with automation so as i already mentioned how to decide what which neurons are outlying uh, and uh, what would be the, the appetite of, uh, of a researcher based on the data set when it comes to the, uh, the proportion of outliers in our data set. Uh, yeah, uh, that would be pretty much it mostly. Uh, for the um, graphics, I used uh, Plotly and uh, package Kohenen, and also for all of the um, computations, I use patch, uh, package Kohenen from, uh, from CRAN. It is actually great. Lately, uh, I think in November 2019, it got some patches uh, that enabled uh, a researcher to try different combinations of this algorithm, which is actually great, and it, it lacked it a little bit. Right now, it, it, it is ready to be widely used, in my opinion. Uh, for such purposes. So that would be it actually for me. Thank you so much. Uh, and if you have any questions, then I will be uh, waiting on Slack for answering them. Perfect, perfect. Thank you so much, Christian. Also, uh, I really like those images that you used and it gave quite, you know, interaction. Perfect. <laughs> it was quite interesting one. Thank you. All right, then. Let's go on with our next speaker. And our next, next speaker will be Stefan Morris, and he will be talking about handling complex missing data problems in time series. So Stefan, stage is yours. Good luck. All right. Thank you. Perfect. Wait a moment. Can you see my screen? Yes, exactly. We can see it. Perfect. Perfect. OK, thanks. So, hello, I'm Stef Moritz from the Institute of Data Science from TH Cologne in Germany. And today I'll be talking about handling complex missing data problems in time series. So, oh, great. Ah, here we go. So, that's me, just a picture of me in case the video doesn't work. So, and, uh, um, well, talk will be a little bit split between um, the topic itself and how you can, how the MQTS package can help you there. Um, well, actually we're missing a lot of time series. So we are quite often interested in how something behaves in time, but also missing data is quite common in time series, especially with sensor data. Typical problems are, um, well, data recording problems might be a sensor failure or maybe the, um, the guy who was supposed to count animals or something didn't show up the day or overslept, or there are data transmission problems, internet problems, for example. Or maybe there's a problem with the data processing pipeline. And often the data is forever lost. And well, that's where the MQJS package can help you. Just a short wrap up. It helps in three areas, actually. It's imputation with our um, like um, imputation functions that replace missing values with um, reasonable values, visualization functions for, um, well, getting insights about CNA distributions and assessing how good the imputations are actually, and um, functions for um, plotting some NA statistics uh, again. So um, for the imputation functions, there are several from simple to more advanced functions. Usually the syntax is na underscore interpolation, and then you put in your um, well data set and get back the um, complete data. And for the visualization, also the syntax is ggplot underscore na, and then the name of the plot. And these are quite um, useful, these visualizations. And then there's uh, the stats functions. And well, actually, how does time series imputation work in general? 
Um, well, it's no magic, of course. It's like progress in machine learning and stuff. And um, it's based on um, correlations. If you look at, well, rather classical um, imputation for cross-sectional data sets, um, this is based on correlations between variables. So if you have four variables, then you use the other three variables, for example, to estimate this value. If you would have time series cross-sectional um, data, you can actually use intervariable and um, the time information. And if you have just univariate time series, as we're talking about today, like here, um, well, then you just have the time information and you just can use the time information to estimate your NAs. So is time series imputation always complicated? Um, not necessarily. Um, let me introduce you to our um, data set we recorded. It's from a project where we, um, well, in a water grid, um, imagine a drinking water grid, and there are some sensors at some um, point in the drinking water grid, and we are measuring, for example, the temperature. Um, for this plot, um, I use the ggplot NA distribution function. We have the function, you give them a data set with missing values, and you get a plot where the um, well, missing regions are highlighted in red, actually. So this, this is just 60 minutes now, and it was measured um, in one minute intervals. I actually um, artificially um, deleted this data just to show you. And as you can see, this is quite an easy data set for imputation. It's like the values are like, the next value is quite similar to the value before always. And these increases, that's actually the, well, it's at the sensor resolution, basically. The sensor can't go deeper than this um, step increase. And there's nowhere like a two-step increase. So it's quite an easy data set for imputation. And if you look now, if you just apply this NA underscore LOCF function, so last observation carried forward function, then we see this does already quite a good job. Let me explain this to you further. Like I used this ggplot NA imputation functions. This is for assessing your um, imputations you did. So um, in red, you can see um, the imputations we um, made with this function. And in green, usually you don't have it. That's the crown truth actually. I mean, I have it now because I artificially deleted this um, values, but usually you don't have it, of course. But as you can see, if you just always look at the value before, before the end gap, and then put it there, it's quite a decent result and probably no other um, imputation method would give really better results. So we have the first is a perfect fit, next is a perfect fit. Okay, and this, this doesn't really fit, but well, that's a perfect, that's a perfect fit and that's a perfect fit. So there are also cases where um, easy methods can give quite good result and yeah, there's sometimes serious imputation problems that are actually easy to solve. Mostly or often these are related to physical processes with gradual transition. Imagine this um, sea, for example, if you're measuring the water temperature there, it won't have any sudden increases like 10 degrees or something like this. And if you now have a high measuring interval compared to the rate of change, and um, don't have a too fine sensor resolution, then um, this data set will be quite good for this easy, um, well, imputation functions. And of course, you must have short um, gaps, like only just one in a missing in a row or something like this. So simple solutions for simple problems. Well, so interpolation and last observation carried forward or next observation carried backward are often already quite good, but there's caution needed. For some problems, they are actually a bad fit and you should do some investigation actually if that's really the way you want to go or if your problem is a little bit more complex and you would introduce errors with these um, functions. But what can for sure be said like mean imputation should always be avoided because it nearly always gives completely wrong results. Just um, 
an example for mean imputation and why it's usually a bad idea. The same series now, but we use now mean imputation, NA underscore mean. And as you see, these imputed values are way off from the ground truth. So, well, don't use it. Um, yeah, just a good, quick wrap up. There are plenty of algorithms in the QTS package. You can see here the more simple algorithms and down below more advanced algorithms. Actually, if we would look closer at this, there are even more because for example, in a interpolation, there's some um, linear interpolation, spline interpolation, Stein interpolation, or yeah, this um, splits up a little bit also. So the usage, as I said, is quite easy. You have um, the function, for example, NA Kalman, that's um, Kalman's moving state space models. And then you um, input a data set with missing data and you give, get the complete data set back. Also easy to use in, um, well, pipe. So if you can pipe through. And what's also nice is because in R you have lots of time series, different time series objects. And um, it actually works with quite a lot of them. It works with Sue, Tibble, Tibble, data frames and you give, it's worked like this. You give, um, for example, a TS object in and you get a TS object back. So it's quite nice. You don't have to be too much data wrangling going on there. So um, what actually makes time series problems complicated to um, go a little bit? It's always if there's low autocorrelation or no patterns, then of course you can't do any sensible, like you can, well, continue the random walk, but nothing else, of course. Um, well, if time series is more complex with trends and seasonalities, like you see here, then um, the easy methods like NALOCF or um, the interpolation will fail probably. But there are more advanced functions which can give good results for these um, time series. Then, of course, um, time series with a lot of missing data. The more missing data, the more complicated it gets. Um, again, a plot. Here's much more missing data I introduced. And well, let me introduce you to the stats and a function. That's part of the output of the function, actually. There's way more um, stats you get. But you see here, 22% missing data in this series now. There are 32 gaps. And, but the average gap size, so it's always one. Um, and if we would now apply, for example, NA interpolation, you already see, well, it's still somewhere in the region of the ground truth. But it's a little bit off actually. But interestingly, it's often not the amount of missing data. What's really difficult to solve is long NA gaps actually, like in this example I created for you. Also same missing data percentage, number of gaps is just one, but that's very long now. So a 32 gap, uh, 32 NA gap. And well, that's harder to solve because you basically don't know what's happening in the middle of the region at all. And if you now apply NA interpolation, that's way off now. If you look how the ground cruise develops and the interpolation goes just from there to there and not a good result actually for this one. So you have to look a little bit um, how do I have a complicated problem where I need advanced methods or do you have a simple problem where I can use just simple methods? And how do I know it? Well, you could use the plots of the package from the QTS package. For example, ttplot and a gap size gives you um, the length of the gap. So how many one NA gaps do I have? Or do I have like this, a 30, 42 NA gap, also a very big NA gap somewhere in there. Or as I said, you could use the stats NA function. That's also not everything what the function gives, but um, well, it shows a little bit, for example, the longest NA gap or, well, most frequent gap size, number of gaps, and so on and so on. So um, actually, now we know maybe we have a complicated or more complicated time series. Which algorithms from the package should I use for these more complicated time series? And usually good um, results for like this series with seasonality and trends, strong seasonalities and strong trends. Um, is give the seasonally decomposed missing value imputation, NA underscore C deck. As you see, it's not the same series as before. It's TSR gap that's also in the package. It's an ensemble series. And as you see, well, it's quite close. Still, it's a complicated series, but quite close. 
And then there would be imputation by Kalman smoothing on structural time series models. Um, you also see it's also equally close. So that depends on the series actually, which one is better. And there are also different options to the NA Kalman um, function like um, uh, Kalman smoothing on the state space representation or RIMA model. This one is quite good because it's quite flexible um, and adapts good to uh, a wide range of time series actually. And yeah, that's a short intro actually. Some final thoughts before I have to end my, um, well, presentation. It's always good to use plots to check the performance of your imputation method or model. Like to see if it's something is off, if this could be possible. And also in the ImputeTS package, there are also some plots you can use for larger time series because not usually time series are not like 100 um, well observations like in this toy examples often they are quite longer and then it's harder to check actually if um, your um, imputations um, still fit in well. If you would take it a little bit more on the advanced level, you could also test the performance um, of your imputation functions on the available data. So it's something a little bit like the ones I did. You would have to artificially remove data, then apply um, imputation methods and then to look um, well how did how well did it perform on the available data to um, well draw some conclusions for the missing data you want to use it on. Um, but sometimes you only get unsatisfactory solutions. I mean, there's only so much um, correlation or out correlation um, available and sometimes the gaps are just too long and sometimes there will be no good solutions actually. And another part is, um, this package is mostly for univariate time series or um, time series where you don't have strong intervariable correlations. Um, so if you have other correlated time series, um, like for example, if you are looking at temperatures, you might have um, the temperature for, for one city missing, but maybe you have the temperature for the neighboring city, then it makes sense um, to also consider employing these um, correlations between the series, but then you would have to use other packages additionally, some packages for um, like, um, well, traditional um, imputation. Yeah, so it might also uh, make sense to take a look at this. So I guess I'm strictly at the 15 minutes now. Thanks a lot for your attention and it was nice to be here. Thanks. Perfect, Stefan. It was quite interesting topic. And thanks a lot for your speech. All right, so we can go on with our next speaker. And our next speaker will be Ivo Agustinski from Rostov University of Economics and Business. And he's going to talk about clustering time series. Ivo, the stage is yours. Good luck. So hello, good afternoon, everyone. And I will to some extent continue previous presentation. Just uh, I will share my screen. Uh, so I will continue the topic of, of time series. Yes, it's, it's, it's a tough topic as it was mentioned before. And I give you some solutions and clues in, in a different direction. Yes, so the problem is, uh, which uh, we have quite many of us have is uh, how to analyze, compare, and present uh, multiple time series. Yeah, so it's not a problem where we have one, two, or three, but when we have dozens of time series, so to compare and to eliminate and to present them is is a big uh, and tough task. Uh, so what tools are we actually using? So of course, ninety nine percent to start with correlations. Uh, and we all know problems with correlations. Yes, yeah? so sometimes uh, in the data sets, uh, data set shows there are some correlations where in, in, in reality there are no correlations and vice versa. Yes, there are some uh, relations between variables, between time series, and correlations not available to, to show uh, this, uh, this relation. So we also have in statistics or in econometrics different methods like integration. Uh, which calculates if the two processes are co-integrated there is a linear combination of the two processes which is stationary uh, with all these issues with stationarity etc etc then we have a codependence uh, also 
uh, common features uh, as, as also you used uh, techniques. The problem is with coordination with some of these techniques, uh, coordination for co co integration, for example, that they are binary. So that means uh, where so that there is some type of co-integration in, in the data all over is no co-integration, yes? but, but not necessarily uh, what we are uh what we do what we need yes from from the data for what was not the answer we uh we expect if we have more uh and multiple time series uh this binary uh, selection is is, is is not appropriate yes we'd like to know uh with distances we'd like to have much more information from our data uh so here enters uh, the clustering uh, as as a method of unsupervised uh, machine learning technique, um, which is quite popular in, in in many solutions, but not as popular as it it should be in time series uh, analysis. Why it, it is uh, it's a good candidate for for to to use as as, as a tool for uh, for time series analysis because it creates. Uh, a groups yes as as a result of, of this clustering method you would uh, achieve you would have uh, some wise informative uh, dendrograms yes easy to understand uh, dendrograms of course it depends of how many uh, time series actually do you have if if you have um, thousands of or, or more uh, it could be hard to 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 to, to pre present it in in, in these dendrograms but still it is possible as you would uh see uh for example this is uh, the type of 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 uh, dendrogram we uh we get as as a result of our uh, research of uh, in, in, in the search of the best method of 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 clustering time series so if you have more time series of course you would have more complicated dendrograms but still you can uh decide and choose which level of of of, of granularity granularity uh you are you are best of yes you find the best uh the most informative so what is the problem yes so we have very nice very promising methods uh which should provide very very informative graphs and give us lots of information about relations uh in, within our data which is most important for us uh and the problem the, the main problem is uh, what does it mean yes what how to calculate these distances how to interpret these relations between this time series yes? so close distant what what does it mean yes so the whole project which with us i will show you and recommendations i will show you at the end of of, of, of my presentation is is about this us answering this this question and so we are trying to find out uh and distinguish and, and clarify relations between different time series yes so answer questions which time series are related to each other where is some trans probability that are interdependent uh and which are not yes? so how we define this uh, probability let's say it's not statistical statistical uh probability uh but more you know as, as we are thinking about it uh, about relations, dependence between uh, uh, time series. So we assume that the close, similar, or let's assume uh, potentially interdependent uh, time series is are uh, the time series which have similar uh, frequency. Yes. So we are not interested in in, in extremes. So uh, this minimum and maximum values of of different time series. With this, this uh, extremes are not important for us. Uh, so with the time series which have much different maximums and and minimums, as you can see on this uh, graph uh, on on the, on on the top, are still quite similar. Yes? So what makes time different time series dissimilar is differences in in uh, frequency. So even as you can see on this graph below, different time series have almost the same maximum and minimum values they are not similar because the frequency is uh, is much different yeah? so if we uh classify or put all our time series between these two extremes i would say uh, you would have some uh, distances between different time series 
Uh, so it's all about frequency. Yes? So fre frequency is our enemy. Yes? So uh, if there are differences in frequency, that means our time series are uh, more likely to be to be different, uh, to be uh, distant from each other, or and to be not influencing each other. Yes, of course, it's an assumption. Yes, we can agree or disagree with the assumption, but I think it's quite logical and quite uh, useful. So, how what methods are best in distinguishing this uh, this uh, more or less distant time series? Uh, in this meaning, as, as I uh, explained in previous slides. So, of course, there's lots of uh, different uh, measures of, 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 of distance. Uh, but I would start from, from a data, yes, because, of course, we didn't compare uh, with uh, sine waves uh, or, or anything like that. We tried uh, to, to find uh, the best uh, technique to, 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 to measure this distance uh, from real da data. And because I'm an assistant professor at the University of Economics, so I decided to take uh, economic uh, data and lots of economic data from different countries uh, and different types of economic data. As you can see here, uh, in, we, we, we got two uh, sets. One first set co co contained uh, 52 time series. Uh, GDP and, and, and not only and financial time series as well plus for artificial series, sine and triangular waves uh, of three periods, uh, and, 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 and we, may, we add lots of perturbations. Yeah? So we tortured our, our, on our, our data in, in many ways. So we multiplied values of, by constant, adding constant, adding, uh, we added uh, random noise, uh, and all, all this combination all, all, all this above to, to make this, uh, our results the most general as possible. Yes, to, 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 to be able to implement and to, to able to, uh, mm, to have it useful for, for as many uh, mm, different uh, problems as possible. And uh, to, to, to extend our data set and to, 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 to count for, for different problems, we also uh, use data uh, 24, 45 times, as you can see here, of quarter to quarter percentage change. So quarter to quarter is not important here. Important is that we took also this percentage change, uh, so this way of tra tra transform data set in, in this way, plus, of course, uh, the same uh, perturbations as in previous data sets. So we got, got a lot of time series, a lot of different uh, time series, a uh, lot of different time series uh, to uh, test on uh, different uh, measures of, of distance. Yes, and of course we didn't uh, we didn't want to uh, reinvent the wheel and and use some uh, very good uh, R packages, uh, namely uh, TS uh, dist package, which includes, as you can see here, more than twenty four. Uh, dissimilarity measures. There are very, very, very small dissimilarity measures in this package, but we decided to take only this one, which uh, we do not need to uh, adjust, yes, which do, 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 do not need any additional uh, variables uh, to include, yes. So uh, this on which only we were using, we, we could only put our data and that's all, not, not additional parameters were needed. So still, there's quite a lot of uh, of lot of uh, options to to to, to choose uh, with, uh, and no, oh, I'm quite fast uh, in, in my presentation, uh, but to, I, I don't want to keep you in 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 in, in uh, uh, without an answer. So the winner is uh, the permutation distribution uh, clustering. Yes. So I would don't uh, I won't go deeper into explaining how this method works uh, and at the end of the presentation I will, I will show you a link to, to my paper, scientific paper, which we, where we would find all the details and the information etc etc uh, about uh, all this procedure. Uh, but I think for, for, for our purposes for, for this conference it is, it is most important what who is the winner, yes? And a few words about uh, how this permutation distribution clustering actually works. I don't go into deeper, as I said, if you are interested, it is lots of information on, on, on the web. 
but of course method is one testing uh, environment is is another important issue uh, but a few more slides about results yes uh, is is it really uh you know helpful yes uh, with this method so uh, we tested this method of course not only about how it measures uh technically or mathematically uh, with distances but of course this important uh issue is about uh interpretation yes a really interpretation of 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 results and as i said i used economic uh, time series and i must say that uh, it is the results of clustering macroeconomic time series like gdp for example uh, is, is confirmed with another data using uh, another uh, research using different uh, economic method methods so for for all these uh, different time series which I uh, uh, we, we were using, uh, all all the uh, all results are validated by other uh, research as well, uh, and and all these graphs are taken from from the, from my research paper. So, uh, if you'd like to see uh, it and and think about it and look at different uh, graphs, so uh, again, a look uh, at this paper. So the link is below here, as you can see here. Uh, and uh, and finally, the, 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 some some additional very useful uh, feature of all this quite long and time-consuming research is that we are talking about two lines of code actually. Yes. So if you know and you believe me and if you believe my research that this uh, clustering uh, method is 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 really uh, the best option. Uh, it's it's enough to to use these two lines of code to to use it. Yes. First one. Uh, calculates uh, this, this uh, dissimilarity, and the second one is used to uh, to draw a, uh, a graph, and that's all. That's all. So, if you would have any qu additional questions, uh, I will be available at, at at Slack, and and I will go and watch uh, the YouTube channel as well. So, thank you very much, and uh, use <laughs> use this method as 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 often as 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 possible. So, thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you very much, Ivo, uh, for for your uh, for your great great speech. And so, unfortunately, we don't have time today because uh, we have to start our keynote. And but we hope we have already one more speaker who is Daniel. And so we will move him to to another another uh, stream, and then he will be talking there as a highlighted speaker. So this this session will be just for her, and I hope uh, he forgives us for this. Uh, sorry for that, and because of the delay, and uh, we just needed to do something like that. Perfect. So uh, thank you so much once again, and uh, so we will see uh, Daniel in in couple of minutes on another session, and so thanks a lot for your speeches, and it was pleasure to uh, be with you and you can of course ask your questions on slack and so see you in a moment bye 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 ah.